more time. Welcome, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Oh, I'm so excited for this conversation. Um, so I, I'm really thrilled to introduce you to two people who I have taken great inspiration from over the course of the last uh, several years from afar. And I got to meet them for the first time on Thursday night uh, when um, professors David Myers and uh, Nomi Stolzenberg invite, uh, invited them to come speak to an intimate group. and. I am so thrilled that we get to share your voices and your vision with our community here. Um, so I, I will I will say um, I want I'm going to ask you rather than reading your bios to share your stories with uh, with our community. But this is Sally Abed and Alonli Green, um, who are two of the leaders of Omdim Biyachad, and I know there's an Arabic name for it as well. What is it? Nakafman. Nakafman. Yeah. Okay, which is uh, translated in English as standing together. And I will simply say, and you'll hear uh, a, a lot more about this from, uh, from me probably over the course of our time together. Um, what I shared with, with Sally and Alon Lee on Thursday night, which is in my darkest hours of despair, when it comes to the reality on the ground and the future that we are watching unfold in the state of Israel right now, um, you are my hope. <laughs> um, we're watching and we're witnessing what you're doing together. And I know that for me and for many American Jews, um, the fact that you are doing what you do every single day and that you're in the trenches the way that you are and that you're pronouncing the vision that you are putting forward um, is an incredible source of inspiration and source of hope uh, for me and for our community and for so many of us. So. I know that the work is incredibly grueling and difficult, and I know it's also very isolating and challenging. And I hope that you feel, and I hope that this visit will help strengthen the feeling um, that there are bonds of support and connectedness and affirmation that are coming even over the sea, even over the seas, and um, especially in the most trying times. So we're, I'm going to start and end with big uh, thank you to you um, and to all of your colleagues in the work over there. Um, we're deeply moved by and deeply grateful for all that you that you have done and continue to do. So, um, so I would love if we can start, and just to give folks a sense of where um, I hope this conversation will go, I would love if you could both start by really introducing yourselves to our community, those who are here in person right now, and those who are jo joining us on live stream, and others who will watch this later, and tell us a little bit about your own personal stories and how you came into the work. Um, and, and then I want to have a real conversation about how you understand this particular political moment, especially in light of... Um, of the elections in November and um, this really striking uh, clarity that I think we all now have about um, the direction that many people in Israel are trying to take the country and what a counter vision uh, is that you've offered and we'll talk about your approach to, to change and, and then I would love, we're gonna do this as a conversation and then I would love if folks have questions, want to engage in some conversation, we can do this, uh, we can dialogue all together. I also want to um, just welcome and acknowledge we have a group of folks from Israel who are visiting with us totally uh, coincidentally on this Shabbat as well. And so we'd love for your voices to be part of this conversation, uh, this dialogue too. Um, so welcome and thank you. Um, Sally, will you start? Yeah, of course. Um, I'll take this just so I don't reach to it. Okay, yeah, much better. Hi, everyone. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Um, you know, we make this a lot. Uh, you know, we do meet and encounter a lot of communities, and I must say, I, f I feel I feel the love here. <laughs> I feel the. Um, it really is a very. I feel like the special community that you have uh, created here, and that all all of you uh, created here. So thank you for having us. We're very very grateful. Uh, to be here. My name is Sally Abed. I am um, a Palestinian citizen of Israel. I grew up in Me'aliyah, uh, which is uh, in the Western Galilee, in the north. 
Um, and I will tell you a little bit about my personal story uh, before we really get to the current moment, which I know is very urgent, but um, I think it's important to also understand what we have um, before we start reacting to crises. <laughs> and it, it helps me understand what we have as a movement. And I hope that you, that my personal story will help you understand what we have uh, before we start reacting. Um, I grew up to a Palestinian family that never uh, identified as Palestinian. Um, uh, one of my very first memories uh, with my grandmother, uh, you know, that were really shocking, that really shaped me, where when I had a Jewish friend over from Ma'alot, uh, if you know it, it's a Jewish town next to Ma'alia, very close. And I grew up with my grandma and my grandpa, you know, with crazy stories about 48, about uh, my grandfather, some heroic and some very tragic. Uh, my grandpa uh, was raised by his aunt who was shot dead in front of him in 48. Um, and he found himself on a donkey with his inheritance, basically his, her gold, uh, fleeing to... Um, uh, to Lebanon by himself and uh, tied to a tree by robbers and they stole everything and you know it's a crazy story of going to Beirut and back as a 12 year old and um, I grew up with my grandma telling me how they basically lived in the valley they evacuated um, the the village for a whole month uh, even more that's what she remembers um, when she was also 12 and they had to basically like figure out how to, they were going to live in a valley, Nachal Achziv, if you know where that is, in the Western Galilee. Um, and it was stories, it was very heroic for me. It was part of my grandparents' history, my family's history, my village history. And um, that's how I grew up, down these stories. Uh, I didn't know what Nakba meant politically. I didn't know what... It meant why it happened. <laughs> I didn't know th what that sense of otherness meant for me growing up in Israel. And when I told uh, my grandma to tell my friend, my Jewish friend, the amazing stories, my grandma shouted at me and she told me, we don't tell these stories to Jews. Um, and I remember that moment very well of, okay, there are things that we don't tell. And I think that was like the very first step for me of really that conditional partnership, that conditional relationship we have, that otherness uh, with, Jewish, with Jewish people, with Jewish Israelis. Uh, I grew up then, uh, you know, with parents who actually are a second generation who got uh, good jobs, decent jobs. We lived a good life. Um, you know, they were able to provide for us and we were comfortable. And uh, I remember just being completely depoliticized and for it to be completely, I, I remember news or if there was something happening or the intifada or my parents would completely, you know, have separate their work from their personal frustrations and personal trauma and personal collective trauma as, as Palestinians. And then I got to go uh, abroad. Um, I actually came to the US to study here for college in Indiana, Earlham College. I don't know if anyone knows. Okay, here we go. <laughs> There's always someone in the, uh, in the crowd that knows uh, Earlham, so I always mention it. <laughs> and uh, leave it for the Quakers to politicize you, right? Uh, <laughs> And um, I remember I went there and I met uh, uh, people from Gaza and people from the West Bank and people from, and it was the first time that I met them on an equal ground. And I remember they were like, oh, where are you from? I didn't say, I, I, I know, I always knew that I don't say I'm from Israel. I knew that, but I didn't, I never, you know, knew what I am. <laughs> uh, I knew that it's touchy to say Israel with them. I didn't know why. And I said, the Western Galilee. I'm from the Western Galilee. And then they came and they told me, oh, another Palestinian. And they hugged me. And that was a very big political moment for me of like, okay, well, but what does that mean? Um, you know, what does that mean? 
And it took me really a long time. And thankfully, I had four long years in a very neutral, safe space here in the US to be able to connect the dots and actually try to understand what it means for me to be a native Palestinian in a Jewish state uh, and what it means for me to be part of other people. It was really complex for me. It was a complex relationship to build and, and to fathom. And uh, with that, I also was able to meet Jewish Americans, I was able to meet black Americans, Latinos, LGBTQ, uh, climate uh, justice uh, activists from all of these different backgrounds. And Earlham College was actually the first or the second. Uh, I don't remember, I always, I need to check that. Um, uh, college in the US to divest from polluting industries through organizing all these different amazing organized groups within campus. And that was a very powerful moment for me because I really felt like I was fully Palestinian, I was fully a woman, but I was fully an ally. I was also part of something much bigger than me that really understood the different narratives and the different stories, but also understood the big joint struggle that we had. Four years later, and I got back home, and it was, it was shocking. I really, you know, I got a slap on the face. Um, I started working in a startup in Tel Aviv, and uh, like many do. Uh, and uh, four months in, I remember I had just a very casual meeting, uh, a conversation with one of my colleagues. And I was like, yeah, in our Palestinian society, you know, like we do, I don't even remember what I said. And the next day, sure enough, I was called on for a hearing because it was too political to refer to our Arab society as a Palestinian society. Why would you want to do that? Why do you want to provoke your Jewish colleagues by calling yourself Palestinian? What were you trying to do? That was while I was also working next to settlers who would commute from the West Bank every day on a Jewish-only roads with their rifles and sit next to me, and I had to sit with their rifles next to me every day. And that wasn't political, right? That was normal. Uh, so it was very shocking for me, not only the hostility, but also the lack of space for me to be Palestinian, to be political, and equally frustrating for me, the fact that I didn't have a space to advance my other interests, like a normal, person, a normal young woman <laughs> in a society that grew up with a gay brother who's struggling with his prospects of family and, and relationships and marriage and kids, uh, who is, uh, you know, paying at that time around 40% of my income in rent in Yaffa, in a very old apartment in Yaffa, <laughs> and, you know, who would have to walk to work sometimes for 40 minutes because the bus wouldn't come from Yaffa to Tel Aviv, and who is, you know, as probably, hopefully, a future mother is extremely worried about climate crisis. And I was like, where, where are the, how can I be, where is my society? There's no society. I am not part of that. I'm not seen as a partner in any kind of struggle that can be progressive, that actually relates to my life and the lives of the people around me in my society, in my Palestinian society, as well as Israeli one. And it really was very frustrating at that time. And my first invitation to this new majority that I wanted to be part of, to this new place that empowered me as a Palestinian, as a woman, but also as a young person living in a, in a society, <laughs> it was through standing together. And that invitation was um, in southern Tel Aviv uh, in 2018, uh, there was a, a struggle to uh, basically um, halt the deportation of asylum seekers, African asylum seekers, mainly from Sudan and Eritrea. And uh, obviously, uh, Bibi Netanyahu's government decided to deport around 27,000 people. Um, 
and standing together, sure enough, went there and organized, uh, you know, southern Tel Avivans as well as northern Tel Avivans, and they completely changed the story from the story of us, the Israelis, and them, asylum seekers, dangerous, violent, to actually us, the residents of southern Tel Aviv, who have been neglected for many, many, many years, and asylum seekers who have been put there without any intention of actually assimilation or integration, and them, the leadership, the political leadership, the municipality, and the government. And we won. Standing together was able to halt that. Yes. And my invitation to that, uh, to that uh, rally was not just simply an event on Facebook or someone sending me. It was really the signs that were on that rally. There were signs in Hebrew, and Arabic. And I really remember that being so powerful to me, like, oh, like they see me as a, as a partner, <laughs> you know, in this social justice issue that has nothing to do with me as a Palestinian, but has to do with all of us and the interest of all of us here. And they are inviting me to be a partner, not just the address of solidarity, which is amazing and powerful, but also a, pow a partner, which was very, very empower empowering for me. A couple of months later, there was the nation state law where, stu where standing together mobilized thousands of people to protect my rights and my equality and my language and my status as a citizen. And, uh, you know, the rest is history, really, of how I got to, to be so active in standing together and be part of the leadership and understand that only through building not only through solidarity of merely, you know, Jewish Arab partnership, it's so much deeper than that of joint struggle and building a new majority in Israeli society, to build the political will, the political capital to fight oppression and inequality and to also resist the occupation towards Israeli-Palestinian peace. And that's what we do at Standing Together. And that's how my story <laughs> relates to, to our theory of change. And uh, I'll leave it to Alondi right now to talk about his story, which is very interesting as well. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Rabbi Sharon, for having us. Hi, all. Um, my name is Alondi Green. I'm 35 years old from Tel Aviv, originally from Tel Aviv. Um, and I'm also part of the national leadership of, of Standing Together, um, which is a Jewish Arab grassroots movement in Israel. And I think um, that my, if we're talking about personal uh, and, and political memories, I think my first political memory um, was, you know, I grew up in a very small family. It was just my mom, my twin brother, and my grandmother. Um, and as a single parent family living in Tel Aviv, my mom struggled economically to survive. And I think my first political memory was when I was at the sixth grade. Um, my school decided to send us to a yearly trip of two days overnight in Elat. It's a southern city, probably you all know it, in Israel. And I remember that the day before the trip, my teacher call out my name uh, in front of the entire class and said that if my mom is not going to pay the fees of the trip, I'm not going to get on the bus the next morning. And I remember that I stared at her eyes, like I really tried to keep staring at my teacher's eyes, understanding that actually everyone else, all the kids are staring at me, and I felt embarrassed and ashamed, and I felt that I have um, no control over this moment, that I didn't choose it. Um, and I think that that's a feeling that got with me um, a lot in my childhood. Living in Tel Aviv, which is actually a well, you know, economic city, people living a quite well life used to. Now it's, people are struggling a lot in, in the economics of, of Israel. Um, and I felt different. I felt, um, you know, I, I discovered I'm gay later on in the years. And I, it's, it's a feeling that really went with me. When I was um, in my last, school, my last year of high school, I started working in a coffee shop. Um, in Tel Aviv, it was uh, one of the biggest um, 
um, coffee shop chain, chains in Israel, the coffee bean and tea leaf. You probably know it from here in, in LA. It's probably the last, pla uh, the, you know, the only place in the world people really know this, uh, this place. And you, they used to be big in Israel. Um, and, you know, as a young person, the only option you have is to work in a coffee place. Um, you don't need a lot of, of training and experience. And I remember working there for my first um, month, working extra hours, working there on Shabbat, working there at night shifts. And I got my first pay slip, um, and I saw that I didn't get paid for that, even though the law requires that you get paid for extra hours and for working at night and for working at Shabbat. And I came to my boss there, and I told him, listen, I did all these hours in, in that requires me to get paid for them. Um, where is the payment? And he told me, listen, this is the conditions here. If you don't like it, you can just cross the street. It's Evan Grohl Street uh, in Tel Aviv. There's a lot of restaurants and coffee, coffee shops. Just go and work somewhere else. Um, and I didn't. I unionized the workers instead. Um, <laughs> uh, I, we've, we've built the first um, ever union of dining industry workers in Israel. Um, and. No, listen, it got me fired, actually. They told me this is a private uh, sector place. Uh, it's not legal to unionize the workers. It is legal. It was legal. So we took them to court with the Estatut. It's the biggest uh, union in, in Israel. And the court brought me back to work with a court's order, which I can tell you it's not the nicest feeling to come back to work in a place that just, just got you fired. But it was a big story. It hit the news. It, it, became, it, became, it became a story in Israel. Um, and we led a six-week um, strike against our um, chain, leading the owner of, of the coffee bean and tea leaf uh, flying all the way from LA, firing the Israeli CEO, and signing a collective agreement with us um, that, that really gave us all the conditions and all, uh, you know, respected all the laws um, of working rights in, in Israel. And I remember that that was the first time in my life that I felt maybe I do have control. Maybe I do have control over my reality, over my life. Um, and in a deep way, I understood that it's, has, it has something to do with me doing it with other people, organizing with other people. I didn't know the word organizing back then. Um, and traditionally, the Israeli society and the Israeli left lacks the tradition of community organizing as, as the way you have it here with the civil rights movement and a lot of different um, you know, movements that use it methodologically to organize people, but I felt the feeling that I do have the ability to change my reality when I work with other people. One other um, amazing um, feeling, lesson that I got um, from this place was that one, it was 300 workers in this uh, chain in Israel, um, and we were five people in the, in the union that led the union. One of them, his name was Nazir. He was an Arab citizen, Palestinian citizen of, of Israel from Jaljulia. So one of the five people that led 300 uh, workers, most of them, 99% of them were um, Jewish, um, one of them was Arab, and he got the trust of most of the, of the workers in, in, the, in the chain. And I felt, okay, so maybe our you know, interests are connected, and maybe it doesn't matter where you come from when you lead a fight to better your life. Um, and you know, th there was a few dots that connected for me back then. A few years later, I, I was working in parliament with someone that's actually sitting here in the, in the crowd. Um, I was a political advisor for, for an MK, and, um, and I, I became um, part of the leadership of the social protest of Israel. Do you know what's the 10th protest, the social protest of 2011? I will tell. So in 2011, um, there was a world wave of social and political protests around the world. It started with the Arab Spring, you all know it, um, moved on into the Indignados movement in Spain, moving to uh, here in the US, the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement. In Israel, we also had a social protest, but it was the biggest protest in the world, proportion-wise. At one night, we had half a million people out in the streets, out of seven million citizens back then. If you will try to compare it to American proportions, it will be 23 million Americans out in the street in one demonstration. It was huge. It was a full summer of protests where people went out to the streets, built tent cities around Israel, demonstrated one week after the other, demanding, you know, um, better lives, lowering the costs of living, and we had hope. 
We had hope. Of course we had hope because we felt like we have so many people out in the streets. Of course the government is going to provide us um, better lives, provide us better um, you know, support for our lives and, and, and responsibility to the citizens. And we said, of course we're going to win. But we didn't. We lost miserably. Benjamin Netanyahu stood with the government and did nothing. And people went back to their homes. They started feeling despair. They started feeling that we've tried, um, that protest doesn't work. And we experienced a huge wave of actually young people from our generation deciding to immigrate out of Israel, moving to Berlin, to New York, to London, to Paris. Tens of thousands of young people chose to leave uh, Israel and felt that there's no hope. Um, no hope left in Israel. And I was part of a group um, of the leadership of this um, social protest that decided that despite of this loss, despite of this feeling of, of lack of hope, we need to, to learn um, the lessons that we can learn out of this uh, protest. One was a very political lesson. Do you know what was the um, main chant, the main slogan of this um, social protest? Probably back there you know. It was Ha'am. Doresh, Tzedek Hevrati, the people demand social justice. The way that we started using this slogan in the first um, rally of, of the social protest was a young Arab lawyer um, from Haifa, um, Palestinian citizen of Israel, coming to us on the first rally, telling, you know, we had the normal chance of, of the social, you know, organizations in Israel. And he said, you know, just a few months back in Egypt, in the, in the Arab Spring, in the Tahrir Square um, protests, they were chanting, El Shab Yurid Adala Ishtimaiya. The people demand social justice. And we looked at each other and we started chanting it and tens of thousands of people were echoing it back and it echoed back from, from the walls. And it was a revolutionary moment in Israeli politics. It was the first time where we used the word the people, Ha'am, El Shab, not in the context of the Jewish people, not in the context of the Palestinian people, but the people of Israel. The citizens of Israel that have the interest to change reality and to demand something, social justice, together. And that is the core politics of standing together, which we launched a few years later. That was a very important lesson for us. The second lesson was it was that it's not enough to mobilize people, only mobilize people, even if you can mobilize tens of thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people as we did. The most important question is what happens the next morning when people get back to their homes. How can you translate those energies, those, those dynamics into a political change, into a social change? How can you absorb the energy? So it's important to mobilize, but it's more important to organize. And that's why we build Standing Together as a movement that organizes Jews and Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel and tries to connect different struggles into one deep, ongoing, long-term struggle um, to change the Israeli society and to bring upon peace and equality and social justice. That's Standing Together and we can continue to talk about it. Thank you. Okay, you see, you see why this had to happen, um, why we had to have this conversation. So thank you. This is a great um, introduction for us. So can you can you share a little bit about your theory of change, especially in light of the Ben Gvir Smotrich ascendancy, this ultra right wing, racist, ultra nationalist government that just uh, is now coming into power? And what happens to a movement like yours, which is, I think, such a profound counter testimony to that to, to the ascendancy of that ultra nationalist right? Um, so, what is the theory of change, and how does your theory of change need to? change now that you're no longer dealing with the previous government, but you're preparing to deal with the incoming government. Yeah. Okay. Um, standing together is actually, our theory of change will not change. <laughs> we really believe that, you know, we have a strategy. Uh, our strategy uh, has, uh, you know, been built since a year and a half ago and we are enacting it for the next couple of years and it's not gonna be changing. With that being said, it is gonna be much more challenging. Um, I think a lot of our spaces are gonna be much harder to work within. Um, uh, standing together, I'll tell you a little bit the context that our, um, 
uh, technical uh, division, just so you understand how we actually work. We are uh, we organize people locally through local chapters. We have eight chapters throughout Israel, as well as uh, student chapters on campuses, also eight of them. We actually just um, uh, expanded to four new student chapters in the peripheries, and I will tell you exactly why, especially in this moment. We need to get to the peripheries. Uh, and we also mobilize people nationally through our national leadership as well as through you know digital organizing and mobilization uh, and we do that around also anti-occupation peace efforts and peace campaigns as well as social and progressive campaigns uh, given the new government uh, I think you know the people in Israel weren't just, moving, they didn't just appear, you know, and just jump right all of a sudden overnight. They were moved right. Um, if you really look at the forces of, you know, movements, uh, think tanks, newspapers, media, so many things that have been heavily funded, organized strategically, methodologically over the years to actually move the Israeli public to the right. And we see that they're reaping their, you know, their fruits. Is that how you say it? Is that the, yeah. And they're, they're, they, they won, they won. Um, they are in government. We have one of the most, not the, it's the most <laughs> dangerous uh, government in my opinion. A government that for me as a Palestinian, uh, you know, living in a, you know, in a place where the third largest party is a Kahanist Jewish supremacist party um, is an extremely um, concerning, um, deeply frightening <laughs> uh, uh, reality for me. It's, uh, it's deeply frightening for me, for my Palestinian people in the occupied territories, waking up every day f to yet another uh, shot dead uh, uh, Palestinian young kids. Um, East Jerusalem, just crazy uh, uh, violence, police brutality. Um, it's really scary. It's also scary for me as a future mother, uh, a future person living in Israel. Um, it, uh, it really is v extremely uh, scary. And, and I, I'm all only saying that is because it's, it can be a little bit paralyzing to understand the gravity of the situation. Um, with that being said, we also understand, you know, a lot of people ask us, but like everyone, you know, half of the people, ev like uh, unlike other industrialized, developed countries, the young people in Israel are right-wing, unlike any other place. What are you gonna do with that? And our answer is they were not just born right, they were moved right, because of lack of alternatives. The left in Israel has failed young people, the younger generation in Israel. They have failed them. They have failed them in many ways of getting, if you really go to the peripheries, you wouldn't really, uh, and ask them when was the last time a political party or a political organization that affiliates with the left and not doesn't even affiliate with the left. When I talk about the left, it's not necessarily how we see the vision of left and right in Israel, which is kind of distorted, you know, pro pro security uh, against uh, the anti-occupation. That's left and right in Israel, and it completely abandons and depoliticizes economic and social issues that are relevant to people's lives, right? Um, and we need to start thinking, how do we get to these people and give them, we can't just tell them you're racist and you voted in a racist government. What you need to, to tell them is give them an alternative politics, an alternative political story, and alternative solutions to their very real problems. And you need to do that while and meeting people where they are. We need to go and start organizing in the peripheries and we need to start talking about livable wage and talk about affordable housing. And yes, also talk about racism and also talk about uh, uh, the occupation, but not merely as me coming to a person in the peripheries uh, who is probably going through a lot of my same 
uh, issues uh, economically and otherwise and can't come to him and tell him, liberate me. What I can tell him is, I'm your partner. Let's improve our lives. Let's work, let's fight for a better livable wage. Let's fight for affordable housing for everyone. And let's try and understand the very deep idea that ending the occupation is exactly the interest of the Israeli people. And that's a very deep idea that I don't think is, is regularly or, or told enough. Uh, and I'll let you talk more. I actually want to just continue from, from this um, exact point. I think that when you ask yourself, um, what is the interest of us, the Israeli people? Do we have the interest to um, keep the occupation going? Do we profit from having um, control over three and a half million people living under our military control and are not our citizens of our country? Does it something that we benefit from? I think the answer is no. Do we, um, can we recognize that the government that was elected right now, and that's a key uh, thing to, to understand, will this government provide solutions to the high costs of living and the low um, uh, salaries of Israelis? The answer is no. They're not, they're not gonna become socialists all of a sudden. They believe in an extreme free market uh, system where people can get very rich and other people are staying very, very poor in Israel. The people that voted for this government, a lot of different communities, a lot of different uh, parts of, of society, a lot of different cities, they need to have a better life. They have the interest to better their lives, but this government is not gonna do that. And also in the question of, of the occupation and of the violence and of the hatred, we can recognize that all of the people in Israel, almost all of the people of, of Israel, they have the interest to live in safety. They have the interest to go in Jerusalem and not be afraid of getting stabbed or not being afraid to answer your phone and talk to your mom in Arabic in the light train in Jerusalem because you maybe can get hit or beaten by other people, or not being afraid to sit in a bar in Tel Aviv and get shot because of an attack. This is an interest that is common to a lot of people in Israel, and we can build a majority around that. We need to reclaim the word security, safety. We need to reclaim the word peace into a place where we talk about the interest of people and not only about moralities that can go above people's head and you say, you know, the occupation is not moral. Yes, it's not moral. But we also need to stand in solidarity with Palestinians, but most of all, we need to stand in solidarity with ourselves and understand that we have a deep interest to end occupation and not to have all these settlers, NGOs um, that bring a lot of money, foreign money from here, the US, like, you know, to Judaize East Jerusalem you know, this kind of, um, of, of settler NGOs that do it very, very strictly. Um, that is not our interest. That is not our interest. It works against the interests of Israelis. Mm -hmm. And there's an opening there, if you understand it, mm -hmm. that the people will not get from this government what they need. Mm -hmm. It's time to isolate these people, the racist leaders of this new government from the people that voted them in and create a conflict there. That's what we need to do. I, I've been thinking about what power American Jews have here, and it's very minimal, and it's in fact, it's getting less and, we're less and less powerful. It used to be that if American Jews rose up really angry about something happening in Israel, you might see that things would shift a little bit, and now the evangelicals are much more important to the Israeli government than American Jews. We're kind of a, we're a pain in the ass. We're not, we're not exactly seen as this great force. Um, so it, it's really, I, so I feel like our best way to have a real impact in this conversation is by supporting and amplifying the efforts from the people who are doing this work on the ground. And we're going to circle back to that in a minute. Um, I, you know, I was talking to um, a friend who, um, who's a rabbi who lives in the Gush, and which is seen as kind of the, it's in the, um, it, it's considered sort of the more moderate face of the settlement enterprise. Um, it's land that even under a peace agreement will remain part of Israel, most likely, um, even in a two-state two solution, if we can still say such a thing as a two-state solution. Um, and they're always seen as sort of the mo kind of the moderate face. Um, they voted 50% in Efrat and in all the gush for the Smotrich Ben Gvir ticket. They, 50%, which was really shocking for a lot of people. Um, 
And so I was talking to this person about how that could be, and here's what he explained to me. He said that in the week before the election that Smotrich um, came and he went into the center of town and he said to people, you know, it took me an hour and 15 minutes to get here from Jerusalem. It should take 15 minutes. The traffic is atrocious. And if there's a left-wing government, they are not gonna invest in making this a two-lane road because that would be investing in the settlement enterprise. But with a right-wing government, we're gonna fix this road so that you can get in and out of Jerusalem like this. And the people roared with applause and then voted for him. And I was so struck by it because whenever we see bad actor governments around the world, and we ask like, how did that happen that we're supposedly democratically elected? They say because they address the immediate interest, right? Like they, they're the ones who are picking up the trash or putting in the speed bumps or whatever. And I feel like, I feel personally affronted by that because I feel like Jews should be long-term thinkers given our history and our Torah. And so, and yet we can see the, how delicious the short-term promise is. Like, I don't want to sit in the car for an hour and 15 minutes. I want to be in the car for 15 minutes and get home and put my kids to bed. So I want to ask you, what's your answer to the short-termism? We had a beautiful talk here about long-term thinking just last Shabbos, right here with the futurist. And he says that part of our problem is that we're always, we're t we tend to think in the immediate instead of envisioning what it could actually look like. And you're not gonna beat Smotrich on traffic. Like traffic's horrible, we live in LA, we know it. So what's the, what is though the long-term vision that we can lift people's gaze to actually think of, to dream of? What is the, what's the very different future that could be so compelling for, for Palestinian citizens of Israel, for, Jew, for Jewish Israelis, for American Jews who just care a lot about this place and aren't what, ready to give up yet. What is the vision that is so compelling that it's even more important and more pressing and more urgent than getting in and out of Efrat faster when I'm on my way home from work after a long day in Jerusalem? Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about um, building politics that is relevant to people, people's politics. We're building a people's movement. Um, and yes, we can mobilize actually a lot of unlikely partners uh, through these things. You know, we organize people in the peripheries, we organize people in uh, in uh, Nebrak and in Jerusalem, ultra-Orthodox uh, Jews who, you know, would never be affiliated with anything leftist. And we were able to mobilize them and actually, you know, recruit even some of them, a small portion of them, into the movement. And But these things are not immediate. Right, and we do understand that you know we we always talk that we organize and we mobilize, but we also start to understand that we need to build stronger communities. We're really you know trying to build almost an impossible, unimaginable kind of society that has never been imagined before. We're trying to build a partnership, a shared identity under a very sh deep feeling of shared destiny of Palestinians and Jewish people as natives, you know, as, as part of, as landlords, <laughs> you know, of, of the land. And this is a story that is never told. It has never been told, never. And, and we understand the, uh, the, the challenge, we really do. And in order to build that kind of identity and that kind of political imagination, you need the political story uh, through livable wage, you need it through affordable housing, even climate. Uh, you know, we do a lot, like every week, and we get people together and we talk, we, you know, a lot of our work is about the political imagination for people, but we also understand that we need uh, two things. One, when there's crisis, when there is the deep polarizing moments, like May of last year, May 2021. Um, I don't know how many of you know uh, what happened then. It was also a war, uh, you know, aggression on, on Gaza, re retaliated by rockets on, on Israel. And there was our streets in Israel, in the binational mixed cities were on fire. Literally, they were on fire. It was very difficult, and I think standing together was able to create that immediate um, 
fee, uh, it, it's imp it's almost impossible to be in the middle during these times. It's very, very polarizing. And I don't think historically, if you look at historically polarizing moments before 2021, there was no one in the middle on the streets mm. during these times. When there was a ceasefire, then yes, mm. some you know peace movements, they would go out and talk about, you know, but then when there were, you know, aggression and there was attacks, you know, and Israel was attacked, no one was talking. Because Palestinians were not allowed to hurt or even be Palestinian during that time, right? They will literally, you will be beaten up. <laughs> I got, personally got hundreds of death threats during that time for just speaking out as a Palestinian. I'm also not allowed to be Israeli, even though I spent all-nighters in shelters and um, you know, was also, my streets were also on fire. I was also arrested, but uh, you know, very, very shortly before that. And, um, and we, and it was very difficult for, for Jewish people to be in the middle, you know, because it, they are faced with hostility, with treason almost, right? Like, what are you doing? They're attacking us. And to build that new story during that time, we provided a very immediate response of safe space in the middle that refused to be polarized. And I, I'm not pretending like we know exactly what that means, right? I'm not pretending like, oh yeah, like Palestine, my Palestinian narrative and his Jewish uh, narrative, you know, it, it works very well in this space. No, it doesn't, okay? We have a lot of different things to navigate, a lot of complexities to, to navigate. But I think that, uh, and that takes me to the second uh, uh, point that we do, that we do is we need to build communities. Um, I think that we don't, we lack, uh, we always talk about coexistence in Israel. Coexistence is really, you know, existing on parallel, you know, spaces, not actually integrating, not actually sharing much other than maybe the supermarket and hospitals, uh, which is also important. I'm not underestimating that, but, um, we need to build shared communities, mixed shared communities. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to do that through our local chapters to provide people with that safe, organized space to be courageous enough to navigate those complexities and those communities to be able to also provide mutual aid and to provide volunteering and provide uh, uh, you know, activities in the community to be able to do them together. And yes, it also includes uh, during uh, COVID, we, we, our chapters actually delivered food uh, uh, packages for people who in need. They helped the elderly, they helped uh, clean things, they helped so many people, you know, just immediate need. Just being there and telling our story, just the mere presence as a community, as a shared community, works on the political imagination and also provides the need. Um, Sorry, I. No. I, I want to. I just as you're speaking, I'm going to turn to just a couple of questions because the hour's growing late. But I just want to say, as you're speaking, I remember being here on one of the Shabbatot during uh, May of 2021, and I was speaking about. I I don't know if any of you remember this, but my my daughter was um, preparing for a big interview, and one of her friends told her, "Whatever question you're asked." You should answer by saying, I reject the premise of the question. And so, because then it makes you seem really smart and you gain time where you can like start to think. And so I said, I was saying that we were living in this moment where people were all asking, are you pro-Israel or pro-Palestine? And I reject the premise of the question. And it was, we were learning, it was in Bamidbar, Sefer Bamidbar in the book of Numbers. And it was about how each of the um, tribes encamped in the desert. And I remember that as I was reading the parsha during the week preparing for Shabbat, I was crying because this was happening. The streets were on fire, the Gaza war. And I thought, I want to be in a camp. I, like this tribe camps here, Don is here and Naftali is here and, and Asher is here. And like, where, but where do people like me go? And like, we're not in any camp because I'm not going to go to the pro-Israel camp and I'm not going to go to the pro-Palestine camp because those don't, those things don't even make sense. I reject the premise of the question. And then, you know, and then I saw you people on the street for, like, they were gathering tens of thousands of Jewish Israelis and Palestinian citizens of Israel together on the street with the, with the burning. And with, there were people being pulled out of taxis and being beaten to death. 
And here they are saying, like, we reject the premise of the question. We're standing here, and we're standing here together. And I thought, oh, that's my tribe, right? Like, that's our tribe. It's the people who are willing to stand in the breach in between these made-up realities, that, that this false binary. And aren't we living in a time where we understand how these binaries are so destructive to our identities and instead thinking in a more in a more fluid way about who we are and who we can be. So I, I'm so grateful to you for taking, for taking to the street during those days. And I know it jeopardized your life. I know it, I'm sure it jeopardized your relationships. It really, it really mattered. It mattered for each other and it mattered for us all the way over here. And I, I'm, I'm so moved by that and grateful for that. I wanna, I know that folks might have a couple of questions. So let's take just a few and then we'll, um, and, you know, and then we'll pull to a close knowing that I really hope this is only the beginning of our, of our relationship um, and of our connection between your organization and, and our community and the broader American Jewish community as well. Yeah, you can well, sign up there to get uh, updates from us. We're not spammy at all. We're a very nice monthly English newsletter just to, <laughs> just to tell you what we're up to. We spam, so we're, um, well, I, and before we, before everyone leaves, I am going to ask you at the very end to tell us exactly, exactly what you would, what you think that we should do if we're feeling a little helpless and like we don't know, you know, American Jews, what can we, t I want you to tell us exactly what to do. But first, let's see what the couple questions are that folks have here. Um, I think that Andrea has a question in the front. So if you can just introduce yourselves and then, and then we'll ask our questions and we'll keep questions short and, and then um, we'll pull to a close. Um, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, you, Sally, you were talking about, uh, you know, those moments where, like, you're in the room and there are these tensions. Like, there's so much that we can do together, and how do you work through the conflict? Or, do you have a way that you think about working through conflict to be able to keep moving forward? And Andrea, if I can just give a, a word of context, I mean, Andrea is one of the leaders in our city in Jewish-Muslim relations and working with New Ground and really helping to build beautiful bridges between the Jewish and Muslim communities here. So if that, if that context is helpful. Um, I remember that time uh, I went to, on the news and I was expected to be the apologetic Arab condemning everything that has to do with whatever Arabs are doing uh, in our mixed towns and apologize for Hamas as well because that's my job, right? Um, and I wasn't expected to be Israeli or be Palestinian who's aching for the bombard, you know, bombarded uh, uh, towns and villages. And um, I got home and uh, the next day, I really, I, it was difficult. It was, there were sirens, all-nighter. I woke up to death threats because I was on the news. Um, and I, I called a lonely, uh, <laughs> and I told him, I can't do this. I, I can't do this. I really can't. Like, I don't know what I need to do. I, I don't know what to do. I, I don't... Why do I need to, I want to hurt. <laughs> I want to like scream and hurt and cry and be pissed and, you know, and I don't get to do that in this shared space. And I think that's when we realized, you know, yes, we need to be strategic and we need to be, you know, not only right, but actually win. And it's a very, very difficult thing to choose to win and not to be right. It's very, very difficult. <laughs> um, and uh, I think we realized uh, that we need, uh, first of all, the communities. I think that was the first time that we really realized we need to strengthen our communities. And we also needed to understand uh, that we need a method that reminds us in groups. You know, we met uh, our students where it was very difficult for our students, for example, on campuses. You know, Palestinian students on campuses had their rooms marked. Um, it was very difficult. It was very dangerous. They were scared and they were expected to be patriotic, Palestinian, pissed. And then they got also treason, you know, like hostility from the Palestinian community and from the Israeli community, uh, Jewish Israeli community. And I think what we uh, did was really just have talks 
moderated talks and remind people why we're doing this. And remind people that what this will lead, what's our theory of change? Why are we doing this? Why it's important? And even now, uh, you know, I always talk about it. If you're pro-Palestinian in, in, in the US, I always say that, you have to be pro-Israeli people. You have to be. And, and I think legitimizing the Jewish-Arab partnership continuously under the very deep thought that it's necessary to build the political will to end the occupation, and that's, that's the answer we had for Palestinians. And for the Jewish people, we had the same answer, uh, you know, but just with them, with the diff why are we doing this for our people? Because we can talk a lot about this joint struggle and joint and, and new majority, but you, we, you also have your own unique affiliation. I'm still a very proud Arab, a very proud Palestinian, and I want that space for myself as well, regardless of the joint struggle. And you, we need to acknowledge that, and we need to respect that. And it's not just about Jewish and Palestinian, by the way. It's about ultra-Orthodox uh, Jews and what they need, to their unique uh, needs and their unique community uh, demands, and Ethiopians and Mizrahi and, uh, you know, uh, former Soviet Union, and we need to acknowledge these diversities and the needs for people and always remind ourselves methodologically, mm. through communities, why we're doing this. So we'll take, um, just, uh, we'll take a two more questions and then we're going to close. Um, would you like to share? Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, you would uh, consider is there a political party in Israel right now that exists that expresses what you're talking about? Or are you guys thinking of creating your own political party, starting from the ground up, which is where you're starting from, and eventually uh, becoming part of, uh, you know, a, you know a, a party that's running for office in the government? And uh, also, what would that party stand for, and how would you, in a very few words, uh, that I can <laughs> tell others that I, I, I saw this incredible lecture today, but either of those points are all Thank you. Um, I would say that, unfortunately, there's no uh, political party that I, I feel, that we feel, that represent the idea of a full equality um, in Israel and um, a land that we are all the landlords in. Mm. I think the last election, the main question of election that the right wing has put on the table was, who's the landlord? Who's the landlord of this land? That literally. was the biggest, literally, literally they actually had this as a, as a slogan. Um, and they mean when they ask it, of course, the Jews are the landlords of this land, of this country, of Israel. We say that we are all the landlords of this place. This home is the home of all of us. And it, it means something deep. It means that the ownership is, is, is shared. And um, I think when you, we look at the Israeli left um, that got shrink and shrink and shrink, uh, shrank and shrank and shrank, until the, the moment where there's only four seats of the Jewish uh, left and another five seats of the Arab um, left, and that's it. And all the rest? Is center. The, he's, you're not the Islamist party. You're not considering it a left. That's why it's yeah. not a left party. Yeah. Um, and then um, when you ask yourself why, why did we come to this place where there is right wing and fifty shades of right wing? I think the answer would be that there is no competition, no real competition in the Israeli politics. There is a big weight on the right wing, and it's tilting all the the game board to the right. But then when you ask yourself, how can we you know, fix this uh, situation, we need to put a weight on the left side and create a competition. Two big ideas fighting for how this land should be, how this country should, should run. And one day, I hope a political party will come also and be you know, representing the ideas. We're going to stay a grassroots movement. It's important to, you know, to create it from the ground. Um, and I will tell you in a second why it's also important to stay a, grass, a grassroots movement. But we need to create a competition in politics and to say, while the right wing is saying we need to preserve the status quo, to preserve the occupation, to have millions of people living under the military control of Israel, but without being citizens or without having the right for independence, we say no, they have the right to independence. Every man on this land have the right to equality. 
to independence, for freedom. Um, and this is a competition in politics. Also, when they say, you know, only the rich get rich and all the rest get poor, we need to say, no, Israel could be a place of social justice, of equality, of living in a place that everyone have prosperity. And I think this will be a party that represents our idea. And just one word about why um, we will not become a political party. I think if you will ask yourself, how did big changes happen in history? The answer will never be that one day a president of some country woke up, let's say the US, in 1919 and decided today we're going to give women the right to vote because I woke up on the right side of, of bed. <laughs> it didn't happen that way. It happened because of an organized struggle of many, many years of women that sacrificed their lives, their homes, their families, got arrested, beaten, kicked out of their, their homes by their husband, and they decided to do this struggle and organize to win. That's why you got the 20th Amendment? Yeah, the 20th Amendment. And we need to have this um, ability to organize people for the long term and to um, push the change we want to see on parliament. If we will be for parliament members in, in parliament, it will not have the same effect. Mm. All right, thank you. I'm gonna, last question from Gary, and a quick one, and then we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up, and then hopefully, maybe if you can stick around for a moment afterwards. Uh, people I, I do just want to say that we are trying to grab uh, uh, power electoral power. We are running for student unions where, uh, you know, we want to run and actually, you know, be able with other partners uh, to take over, you know, the student, the national student union, which has a huge public political way. We also are training uh, local leaders in mixed cities and Palestinian and Jewish cities in the peripheries to run for municipalities for next year. So we are trying to grab power, we just don't think that the political power translation of it on the, you know, on the parliament uh, level is, uh, it, it's, it just have to happen uh, more organically. The one thing you haven't spoken about is money and what it's going to take to be able to do this, and I'm not doing this for your fundraising purposes, okay? <laughs> You've intelligently talked about the principle of community organizing in the middle of this. Unfortunately, the right wing also understands this principle very well. And unfortunately, they now have the Tikva Foundation, who is pouring in probably more than a billion dollars into the community organizing of the right. They've got their partner foundations who are doing this. They've got their tentacles into education, high school, college in Israel, into media, into all sorts of other areas in order to win this battle. Are you folks cognizant of this and the hundreds of millions of dollars that it's going to take to successfully be able to succeed in this battle? Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, according to recent uh, estimates, every one dollar that comes to uh, from the U.S. that comes to, uh, you know, progressive or, you know, center-left, not even progressive, center-left uh, efforts in Israel, there's four to four and a half dollars that go to the right settler movements. Concerning, yeah, at, least. at least. And that's just from the U.S., yeah. yeah? Not talking about, like, Israeli philanthropy and how that's funded, um, funding more right uh, efforts than, than left ones. Um, yes. We need we need a lot of we need money we need money we need much more money um, than <laughs> than we have uh, unfortunately um, it, it does have to do uh, with also expanding our base we're a membership based movement so we also uh, rely a lot on small amount donations um, actually a very significant part of our uh, our. Uh, um, budget is financed by just support monthly supporters and I honestly invite all of you to just donate to us like even five dollars a month it adds up <laughs> um, and yes we also need to understand how to uh, uh, impact the conversation here so we can impact where the money goes to absolutely um, even that one quarter of what they're getting needs to be done strategically. And I do think it's also, unfortunately, it shouldn't be honestly part of our job, but it is going to be part of our responsibility to impact the conversation here, to be able to, for, for people, for people who do have the ability to donate. Our training, our training, 
workshops actually have a lot of study cases of the settler movement. We learn a lot from them. Yeah. So this is a great way to close. Um, oh, okay. Is it quick? Oh, they have to go. They have to go. Okay. I'm going to interpret that question as, like, is those people who believed in the dream of the state of Israel have made impossible things happen before. Can't we muster that same spirit to make impossible things happen now and help build a just and shared future for all who live in that land? And I think that is a very beautiful yes. dream for us. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to invite us. We're all thinking about our end of year tzedakah right now. I mean, please take the material. Follow them on social media if you're not already. And in whatever way you're able to support this organization, either through NIF or directly to Standing Together, um, I think it makes a huge difference and we, we share your dreams. And I think the, everything that you've suggested about youth movements and newspapers and like building and expanding the vision of people who believe that through love we can create a different kind of future is exactly uh, the side of history we should be standing on. So I thank you. Thank you very much for, having, so much for having us. Blessings to you. Blessings. Thank you everybody for sticking around.